Welcome to uh, Advanced Quantitative Research Methods, and it's actually offered by uh, myself and Uberu Penu and other lecturers. So other lecturers will be coming in from different different programs. Now um, that I can testify that two of the past students of this particular program have won the Vice Chancellor's Best Thesis Award um, in the Humanities in 2020. I think 2020 and 2021. So you can say that this course, we really teach well, and I supervise them myself too. So for them to have won the award, to that whatever they learned here was very helpful. One is Dr. Joseph Budu, and another one is Dr. Um, Joshua uh, Kwiku. So uh, I think Joshua, Joshua is in uh, UPSC, and Joseph Budu is a, a senior lecturer and head of department in. Um, uh, School of Technology, Gimpa. So I can say that the course has been very helpful to students here. So please, um, what I do is that I don't teach the course as qualitative research methods, because uh, course is qualitative research methods. I teach you how to do a PhD. The reason is because um, you have done advanced quantitative research methods. It is, this is the course that actually brings everything together to let you understand that all these things you are doing, the, uh, philosophy of management and all the other ones that you are doing. How does it come together to help you do your PhD? That's what I try to answer in this particular course. Now, it's not required of me, but I think that is of better use than just teaching just how to do qualitative research. The reason is that some of you may even go on and do qualitative research. You may end up doing quantitative, but you still need some rubrics to help you to do your good, uh, do a good thesis or PhD. So that's what I focus on in teaching. So as, as much as I teach qualitative research, I'll also be mentoring you to develop research proposal and build your capacity to develop research designs and then maybe and go further to, to analyze qualitative data. So those are the things that I'll be doing, um, helping you to understand what um, research is about, not just qualitative research, helping you to conceptualize research problems and then relate them to conceptual approaches and theories helping you to be able to identify which methods will be appropriate for the kind of study you are doing, and then trying to use one of the qualitative analysis tools like in vivo or any of them, and even manual, manual analysis, helping you to, be able to understand that, how to apply to qualitative data, and then put everything together. Now, the 13 weeks is very, very, it's not in even 11 weeks now. It's not even enough for this course. So usually, uh, we add other tutorial sections and other sessions during the week, but it depends on the students' availability. Previous years have given us more time. Last year, they were not giving us much more time, so I couldn't do much. But I, I will say that it's up to you. When you give us more time, um, other than the time that you have been given, allocated for this, for other sessions, it can help you. Last year, I had to actually mandatedly say that I want to have a class with them because we are not willing for it. But what they don't realize is that I am the lecturer I'm willing to teach. So if you don't make yourself available as a student, you are the one who is losing. I'm not the one who is losing. So let's try as much as possible to cooperate with the lecturer and then with um, other lecturers that will be helping in this particular program. So that's about it. And then in not a specific order, this is the content of what we'll be covering. I will give you this later. We were talking about research. Um, we'll later talk about research paradigms. Don't we we'll don't follow the research uh, uh, the course schedule verbatim. The reason because when I interact with you, I realize certain things that you are weak on, and I more focus on more of them. And then I, I come back to other things to be able to put it into perspective. For example, session two has been covered by of Ifa in last semester's class, but I will rather help it make it more related related to your research work. So I will not necessarily come and teach I'm teaching research paradigms, but I'll end up applying them. So that's what I'm, why, what I'm trying to say. We may not follow the order that I've been written, but it's part of the things that we've been covering. So we'll also talk about the different approaches qualitative research. For example, today I'll mention some of the approaches to you. And then later I'll come back to address you. And I'll talk about some of the other things that you may be needed. So even though you have all this content here, my objective is to try to make sure that you understand most of the things here and know how to be able to apply it to your work and based on what you intend to do. I I would also try my best, my best of, as best as possible to help you to appreciate qualitative data and how to analyze it. And then point you to the right direction in terms of the books that you may need. 
So the books that you may need, there are quite a number of them. Some of them we have them, some of them we, you may have to download them yourself or buy them. So the core book I used to teach is um, Marie said made easy book, but there is a third edition coming out in the next two weeks. But you can get a second edition either from, from right now, there's none, there's none in the bookshop because they are waiting for the third edition. But you can get it from um, Amazon. On, if you are in a hurry to get a book, you can get it from a friend who was in the last year's class. But there's a third edition coming up with more expanded literature and data that works on what well, that be relevant to all. And then there's also other good books from Cresswell, Miles and Huberman, and other researchers that are out there. Any good qualitative data book that you get or qualitative research book will help you. Just that we don't look at only just qualitative research, we also talk about other research methods that are, has to do with um, formulating the research problem, which is not covered in quite a number of qualitative research books. So that's why I focus more on research made easy. Okay, now, some of the students that I've kind of related with and I helped, now some of them are lecturers, um, I've helped in the time they were students um, and done some good work with it. Like this gentleman like this, he won um, Joseph of Florida. Uh, he won one of the best um, uh, pieces in, in the humanities, I think 2021, yeah. And then um, in previous years, I've also done a case study book with some of the students in this class. Usually I, I try to push the students to learn how to publish. And then I've also um, done a number of works with them in terms of publications, post their class. So sometimes some, some of them beyond this class engage me with other publications that we work together. Okay. Now, one of the core assignments that you'll be doing, this is not one of them, that's not all of them, but the most important one that you'll be doing is learning how to write a research proposal which you are supposed to do by the end of the semester. That's why there's no date on submission on it, the end of the semester. Most of the things I will teach and I've taught in the past are placed on a website called um, YouTube. So there's a pay, if you go to YouTube and search for research, what institutes, you'll find, PhD, uh, you'll find um, a set of videos that I've been recording from the class and other classes and you can place it upon. You can use that one to download and watch, or you can watch some of the sessions there. And most often, if I finish a session like this, I will edit it and place it there. Further, uh, you can also search for Richard Barton BSU, and you'll find the very, very first time um, um, set of research work that we uploaded, the research video. That one was very, very old. The more contemporary ones are in the studios. But there were quite a lot of them were, uh, for me online. So you can actually read it from there. I do a number of research projects and you can find some of them here. Not all of them, but you can find some of them here. Okay, so that's just about teaching the syllabus. I'm not going to spend too much time on it because you'll be giving to you for you to read. Okay. And Obed is here. Um, in the, he's a co-host of the class and you see him here. He's in, Obed, where are you supposed to be? Are you in Teddy or? Yeah, in third year now, if I'm right. Hope he's not gone away. Okay. Good. Um, apart from that, um, does anybody have any question before I start? I start the sessions. Hello. Does anybody have any question? George Lamti, do you have any question before I start? Okay. Oh, well, just to ask, my name is Mary. I just wanted to ask if you could share the course outline so that we can have a look at it thoroughly before. Oh, we'll give it to you. Page. We'll give Thank it to you. you. We'll give it to you. Robert will do that later. When we finish the class, we'll share it with you. Thank you very much. Okay, then. Also, the content we will place on Sakai, there's a Sakai page for the class, which we are updating now. So we'll place the content on the Sakai. Mohamed, you have a question? Hello, Fauv. Yep. Hello. Can you, can you go ahead, Mohamed? Please go ahead.
Mohammed. Please go ahead, Mohammed. Okay, we can't hear you. But let's continue. Okay, so we are welcome, welcome to uh, qualitative research as a first session. And um, please, can you hear me? I just want to be sure because I know. Yes, Prof, we can hear you. Yes, we can hear you. Yes, Prof, we can hear you. Some of you are very, very quiet. And let me create each other. But yes, Prof. I'm here. Prof. Do I know you? <laughs> or do you know me? <laughs> Uh, in fact, I can't tell. I can't tell now. Maybe okay. I see you. Okay. George Lampton, yes. I think that one I know. Yes. Y yes. Good morning once again. Yes, I wanted to find out how much um, your material is going to cost. I'm the third edition. I don't know. <clears throat> Currently, the bookshop was selling the uh, the old one for three fifty, but I don't know what's happening to the dollar and. The next one, I know, it's, I know, I know it to be fifty dollars on, on on Amazon, but I'm not very sure what we'll do in Ghana. So, <laughs> we'll, we'll, I'll, I'll try my best to make sure that it's under five hundred Ghana. I'll try my best. I'll I'll I'll, I'll negotiate right. them, or maybe we can get some copies all from right, the all right. class at a good price, and then let the price in, in the bookshop be what it is, whichever one it is. Maybe <laughs> Maybe um, oh, you can discuss with me later and I can find uh, out what it is. So if we know the number that I need in the book, all right, so. we, work with, we work with you on that one, then we can then get a good price for you. So that means that only you guys will get that price. Yeah, so uh, Prof, right, I want to Prof. Prof, I want to find out, I want to find out something. Hello, Prof. Oh, Musa, uh, 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 future Dr. Thomas Musa, you can go ahead. <laughs> Thank you very much, bro. Uh, I want to find out something. I think since we have only about 11 weeks to go, uh, uh, when we, the book, uh, is, is there specific chapters that we need to read for now or we need to focus on the entire book? Oh, don't worry about that. As I'm teaching, the book are tied to what I teach you. As I teach you, you know the chapters that I'm, I'm using. Yo, thank you very much. Yeah, and number two, um, we will be doing other tutorial sessions on the side, so you see what we are doing. Okay. Grateful, Prof. Okay then, thank you. So um, let's start. Let's start so that we can make it. So what I, I don't think I can cover everything, but I'll do my best to cover whatever I can cover today. My objective is will be to try to explain what research is and then link it to what qualitative researches, and then try to link it to what your PhD is about. So those are the three things I want to try and do. And, okay, so I mentioned this one already. And as, as of the time, this one was $20 um, as of 2020. So I don't know the current price that will be sent in here. Okay. Now, to, to about defining research. Now, um, I use a definition for research that is in three parts and um, four key components. The fact that research is an organized, systematic way of finding answers to questions. Now, we say it is systematic because every research that we carry out follows certain scientific uh, principles and procedures defined by the discipline. So there are quite a number of disciplines here. You've got finance, you've got um, HR, we have marketing. And we have accountants. So you realize that all of you have researchers in your field. And all the researchers in your field follow certain scientific procedures and principles, which are defined by those research, research communities. And those research committees uh, deem or assess and tell you what is acceptable within the community. So what is acceptable accounting research? What is acceptable marketing research? What is acceptable um, HR research? Now, the reason why these principles are important is because in order to get reliable and accurate results, those scientific procedures guide the researcher. 
and, 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 and able to establish reliability of your research. So anytime you are saying you're a marketing researcher and you say you're doing marketing research, you need to understand what is how do marketers approach research, especially for specific topics that you may be researching on. So you need to read even and, and know how other marketers have used done research in that particular area so they can have a, a better understanding of what are the right marketing questions to ask. Because sometimes the phenomenon may be general, but the question you may be asking may be belongs to another discipline. For example, let's say that um, somebody wants to study social media and his focus is more about what are the technologies that underpin social media and, and, and what are the, the securities within social media. As soon as you mention the word security and technologies, you are actually talking about more of information systems research. But if you are talking about how does social media advertising affect or influence consumer decisions, you are talking about marketing. How does social media influence HR uh, practices in terms of hiring a new generation or young generation of, 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 of uh, maybe of, 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 of graduates? That is about it has HR questions. So you always need to know what is allowable within the scientific discipline with, with you belong to. That's why you say systematic. The next one is organized. Organized means that irrespective of where we belong to, all research follow a given process, which is generic to all. Researchers try to research on a phenomenon and the phenomenon of research on, they are searching. So there's a question that is defined by a topic. So there's gonna be a topic, there's gonna to be a question, there's going to be the quest process of searching for answers for the question. Those steps in those process are usually generic because those every researcher is asking for questions, is asking questions about a given phenomenon on a given topic within the phenomenon and looking for answers for, for that particular question that they have. So that's why I say it's organized. Now, if respecting of the fact that it's organized and systematic, your objective is to find answers. So every researcher will look for an answer. The answer can be yes or no, but it's still an answer, or even maybe it's still an answer. So, and then lastly, there's supposed to be a question. So we're saying that research is an organized and systematic way of finding answers to questions. Questions are the most cent central part of every research work because the search process is guided by a question. Without a question, we don't know where to start from. The research itself is, becomes relevant becomes, gets its importance, defines its usefulness. In fact, in fact, it even gets its drive and focus and the budget that is needed because of the questions that exist. So the questions give you direction. It gives you the boundary. Because if you ask questions on um, technology, you are telling that you are asking, you, you, you are defining the boundary of your question. If you are asking questions about how it influences consumers, you have defined the boundary. You are even told us the target audience. Like you mentioned the phenomenon. How does it influence consumer patient decisions? A phenomenon like patient decisions. So sometimes questions can even have a, diff, a, diff, a, a context. How do generation Z customers, um, 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 employ, um, employees react to motivation in the workplace? So in, I mean, you are talking about generation Z, you are talking about employees, and you are talking about workplace. It's HR. So even the context here is a workplace. That means that it's an organizational context. So at the end of the day, your research question can define your context. Now, when you know the direction, you know the boundary, you know the target, you know the definition of the phenomenon you are studying, and you know the context, now you can assess what kind of resources you need and what budget you wouldn't even need to be able to carry out the research. So research, activity, research questions matter a lot. They define this research process. They give us guidance. They give us direction. So sometimes I should have said that, ah, somebody has told me my question. Now, somebody has told me my topic. I don't really subscribe to that. The, what is central to your research is the, not the topic, it's a research question. So the topic can be common to both of us. We are all studying, let's say, we are all studying um, or, um, public sector management. But the question I will ask and the question you will ask may be different. So the research question is what gives us more finality and direction. Not the research topic. The topic gives us a general area of space that we are going into within a phenomenon. But what is the research question that we want to answer? Okay. So every research process, like I said, is generic to or organized. It means that you have a topic, you have a question, you design a study, 
You collect the data, you analyze the data, interpret the data, and you inform others. Now, what is central at the PhD level is that when you're doing all of these things, there's a theory in the middle that guides the research process, that informs the, 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 the type of questions you're asking, or it informs the type of variables you want to study. So research process is a step-by-step -step process of, of, of creating and carrying out your research projects. Now, it doesn't mean that you, you find your research work cut out just as in seven steps like this. But if you compare it with your long essay or your thesis, you can identify that there's going to be a preliminary pages, which I'll talk about later. There's going to be a chapter one that you define your research phenomenon. What phenomenon are you studying? What business phenomenon are you studying? That will go into a background. Then the problem in the research concerns the phenomenon. That will give you a research problem. So for example, I am studying motivation. And motivation in the workplace may be my context. So motivation in the workplace in developing countries. Now, what about motivation am I studying? I need to find an aspect on motivation to study. That's why we call the research problem. So I go to literature and find out that what has been done on motivation in the African context or what has been done on motivation in the organization context. And I read that motivation has been studied by different authors. But what we don't know much about is the impact of culture on motivation, not organization culture, but national culture. Well, organization culture and motivation has been studied, but national culture, meaning that will a person be more motivated if he's working in the same organization in Nigeria as compared to working in the same organization in Ghana? So can national culture have an influence on the, the organizational culture and affect the, affect the motivation of the employee? I've given somebody a research, a research area right now. <laughs> so in that scenario, I will get that one from the research problem by checking the existing research. Now, when I know that, then I ask the right question to ask. The right question to ask may be the fact that I may be interested in studying this phenomenon about the impact of national culture on agricultural culture, and is the resultant influence on maybe on, uh, um, on motivation of employees. I may be looking to study this particular phenomenon in the public sector. So now when I look at my research purpose, I will say that the purpose of this study is to explore the impact or to examine the impact of national culture on organizational culture and how it has an indirect or direct effect on the motivation of employees in the public sector. So that one gives me the purpose. Out of that, I'll come up with my objectives and my questions. Then I'll define the significance of my study. Why is it important to study this, this area? Because the current studies in terms of research have not done anything on, look at the relation between national culture and organization culture. I want to do that. And even national culture, organization culture, and public sector is a unique phenomenon. I want to explore that. So I can define my relevance or my significance from that. Then I can look at the practical significance and the policy significance. Then from there, I go to the synopsis of chapters, how it's arranged. Then I go to literature review. What is the existing literature on national uh, on motivation? What literature, what's the existing literature on public sector motivation? What is the existing literature on national culture too? and its influence on, organ on organizational context. So I can look at all of these things and read on them and establish more gaps. Then based on that, I may make a choice of what I want to address. And then find out what is the theoretical way of uh, addressing it. Now the national culture can come from of studies, cultural dimensions. That's one of the theories about studying national culture. I can take that one and I can look at an organizational culture framework and add the two and develop my own conceptual framework to address the research questions. Then I go to the context of study. Now the context of study, some supervisors will tell you to put it in chapter five and let the research methodology come first. It's possible. I mean, this one is just an outline to guide you. So context of study tells me that the public sector I'm studying, which of them am I studying? Public sector in maybe Nigeria, public sector in Ghana, public sector in South Africa. And, and then what is it about? How is it structured? What are the players in the public sector? This is what I'm going to describe in the context of study. Now go to my methodology. I talk about philosophy as a factor to me. I choose my philosophy when I'm doing critical realism. I'm a critical realist, so I will use say that one first. And then I'll do a, well, I'm a pragmatist, I'm a, a constructivist, I'm a positivist or post-positivist, I'm a feminist, I'm a queer. There are so many dimensions of a paradigm. I don't know how many of you factor to you, but there are so many, there are new ones even that are coming up all the time. So I can choose my philosophy and I use that one to approach my study and then develop my strategy. The approach then becomes what I'm doing, qualitative, quantitative, or mixed methods. The strategy then becomes which strategy best fits the quantitative. So is it survey or experiment or qualitative? Is it phenomenology 
or ethnography or grounded theory or case study. Then I can move on to the sample of data collection, data analysis, and ethical considerations. Then I look at my data. What have I collected? If it's qualitative, I come out with my case study. If it's quantitative, I come out with the result because I've got some hypothesis that I'm studying. I, I show the findings, how many I interviewed, what were responses, and then I do my, I bring my structure equation modeling or whichever modeling I'm using. Then I begin to analyze to determine the preliminary findings. Then I go to chapter seven, I discuss the discussion, I do the discuss and link the chapter seven to my literature review and my chapter three. And I can to point out where my PhD is coming out from. Then I go to conclusion and I revisit and I define the new framework I've developed or, or improved. And then I look at the implications of my research and practice and I finish the PhD. So very, very simple. We can finish the PhD in a semester. Some people are laughing. <laughs> but to tell you the truth, it's possible to finish the PhD very, very, very simple. But let me just point out that um, sometimes some people have got seven chapters because they combine the context of study with the result with chapter six. Some supervisors in qualitative allowed their students to do that. I, I my PhD was nine chapters because my case study chapter was on its own, then my analysis chapter was on its own, then the discussion chapter was on its own. So I I know I think no, my my literature review chapter was two or two. That's what happened. And then my case study chapter and the analysis came, then the discussion came. But so my literature review chapter was a two. And then that's it. If you want my PhD, Robert can make it available to you so they can have a look at this. Okay. Now the preliminary pages, according to graduate school, are the cover page, the title page, the declaration. The declaration is where you sign, both the supervisor and the student sign. Abstract, dedication, acknowledgement. Please note the, the, the arrangement. Sometimes your thesis can be returned if you don't arrange it according to what graduate school requires you. It's in the handbook, but note them. Then chapter one, usually we advise that you have a research background. Some departments don't call it research problem, they call it statement or the problem. Um, I usually use either research problem or research rationale. And if you read my book, there's an explanation there why I use that. But I'm just saying that sometimes supervisors use statement of the problem. And then purpose, objectives. Now, some supervisors don't do question, they don't do objectives, they do questions directly from purpose to questions. They will explain why they don't do that, especially the paradigm they belong to. Interpretive paradigm, sometimes they drop the objectives, they don't do objectives, they go straight to questions, significance, and then chapters, and there's no sort of chapters. Okay. Any questions so far? Araba, any question? Are you with us, Araba? Yes, please, I'm here. Yes, <laughs> yeah, we can. Okay. Um, the only thing is, I think the pace. Okay, it's fast for you. I'll take my time. But if you don't understand it, let's, let me know. So let's continue. Now, the research process is different from the research design. The process tells us the different steps that are in the whole research activity. The design is a subset of the research process that tells us well, how and when and where we collect your data. So if you look at it, the design just focus on your methodology. Whilst your research process is the entire activity that you are going to do. Okay. So the types of research. Now, the first thing I want to emphasize is more about the, the, the differences between quantitative and qualitative, because those are the two things that are going to be important. Now, quantitative research has to do with the fact that we are studying the variation and trying to do more predictions. So we look at the extent of a, the extent of a problem and the existence of a relation between the aspects of phenomenon by quantifying the variation. Most of the methods that they use are survey. Good. Then you also from qualitative research, qualitative researchers try to study the meanings people associate with the phenomenon. They're not interested in the variation per se, in quantifying it. They want to describe the variation in explaining and, and, and trying to tell us what is happening there, describing it in terms of what is happening there. But they're not trying to quantify it. They explore the meanings in which people associate with something. So for example, there's a pen in your hand. The meanings that you associate with it has to be with what natural setting are you using the pen? You are currently using the pen to take the notes that I'm talking, I'm, 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 that you are, you are doing as I, I lecture. So you are using the lecture room. It's not a threatening environment. So it's okay. The pen is being used to be able to support your learning activity. However, the pen itself can move its situation and find itself in the bank. 
in which you are signing a check, maybe to go and pay something. At that point of time, the pen has now become a point of responsibility to show that you actually have some, um, uh, um, some money that you want to be able to have access to it. Now that same pen can be taken to you at home, taken by you at home, and then at the, in the evening when your child or your ward has done the homework and wants somebody to look through for, for, for him or her, you go through it and you initial that it has been verified that this is the homework has been done by this, this particular word of mine. That time, the pen is becoming a sign of, sign of responsibility. In all of this, the pen itself has not changed. Maybe the ink has reduced a little bit. But what has been changing is the circumstances that we have been using the pen in. And that brings new meaning. That's what qualitative researchers are interested in. What does the, what means the people associate with the phenomenon at a given time and a given context? So that is what the quantitative researcher is interested in, not the quantifying of the variations, but more of about what meanings and attitudes do people give to whatever you are trying to, you are trying to study. Now, mixed method study means that you are combining the strengths of both to be able to carry out your research, the strength of both of them. So for example, a quantitative researcher may explore to what extent have students adopted mobile phones or a hypothesis such as students who obtain grade A never miss a class. Now, qualitative researchers are more concerned about what is going on in order to be able to describe it. So what is the working condition in the banking industry? Okay, What are the perceptions of traditional medicine among nurses? So that one too is another question has come. Miss Methods, Miss Methods try to combine the strength of both. So sometimes Miss Methods, the first part can have a question that is more quantitative and the second one is more qualitative or it can be vice versa. Or it can even be parallel. They'll do the studies parallel. One is quantitative studies taking place, qualitative studies taking place and they put the two together. Now we could also talk about research by the purpose of the study, exploratory, descriptive, and then explanatory. Now, if you look at it very carefully, exploratory research are the ones that we are not sure of the variables we are trying to study. So we want to just step in. But descriptive research, we are sure of the variables that are we defined. But we want to try and understand and describe those variables that have been defined in a manner in which we are trying to study our phenomenon. But when we go to explanatory research, we know that the variables are defined, the relations are predetermined, and what which of the relationship shall stand. So or we, we, will be confirmed or not, or, or not confirmed. So in each of them, our possible situations could differ. Exploratory research can just have a question of what is the quality of service, quality of service is declining, and we don't know why. So you want to explore why is it declining. But that same question, if we knew why it is declining, we could ask why is it happening so? Then you have got descriptive research where we can ask questions based on the variables that are defined. What have been the trends in downsizing, in organization downsizing over the, over the past years, over the past 10 years? Then the last one is the explanatory. Usually in explanatory studies, you will see that they are a lot of hypotheses that have been defined. And the hypothesis tells us a relationship between one of the one variable and another variable. So you could actually try to explain whether the relationship is strong or not strong, or value or no value. Okay. So let's look into detail. The exploratory researcher seeks to explore an area where little is known. A little, a little research has been done on that particular context or that particular phenomenon. Number one, to explore the antecedents and outcomes to engagement with videos on social media platforms among Generation Z consumers. So Generation Z consumers, you know, you know about them. They, these consumers are very, very, have very short attention spans. So we want to try to know what are the antecedents to out and outcomes to engagement with videos. Why do they or somebody ask why do Generation Z consumers engage with videos or stick to videos online. So that could be another way of asking the same question. Then you can also have other types of questions that may come like this.
So you have to examine the antecedents and outcomes to online health information scheme behavior on social media platforms among Generation Z. Then we can look at the consumer purchase intention of made in Ghana vehicles among Generation Y, Z, Z and then X. To examine antecedents and outcomes of citizen engagement with government through digital platforms. And lastly, to examine the antecedents and outcomes of consumer adoption of financial products among generations Z, Y, and X. So all these are different, different things that you could actually explore to do. But discretion researchers have a different perspective. They try to systematically describe a phenomenon or a situation, usually by asking the what and how question. What are the attitudes of the community towards community library? Or what are the living conditions in farming communities in Ghana? So with these ones, one interesting thing that you see with discrete research is that because the variables are defined, sometimes they are guided by, or most of them they are guided by a research framework. So I can guide, it can, it can detect or inform us on the variables that we are more concerned about or the relationships we are more concerned about. Explanatory research seeks to understand and explain the phenomenon or situation or problem. It's really to ask why and how a particular phenomenon occurs or exists, or there exists a relationship between these two or more factors in the phenomenon. Okay, so for example, why and how do firms value, achieve value amidst the reported fierce competition in the microfinance industry? Now, this is going beyond the question of why and how. Because at the end of the day, you just don't want to explain the why it happens or the how it happens. You also want to try and look at um, how the, the, the creation of value and then why that value creation occurs in the midst of all those competitions. So there's some comparison, uh, competition in the financial finance industry. So there's a comparison being done here. Now for a PAD, most of you will be, be doing a descriptive study or explanatory study. Sometimes others also do exploratory study. Now, beyond the inquiry procedure of doing the research, whether you're doing quantitative, qualitative, and then quantitative. There's also the time dimension of research. When a researcher collects data from a sample from, uh, at a, of a given population at a particular time, we call that one cross-section, cross-sectional study. You are cutting through time to study the phenomenon. Now, sometimes we want to study it over time. So over maybe a year or six months or more. The researcher can identify a sample from the beginning, follow the specific respondents over a specific period of time to observe the changes in the specific respondents and highlight the reasons why. Then you also have cohort longitude now. This one, the, the, the population remains the same, but each time that you want to collect data, you sample from the population. The first one, the sample is the, the same sample you chose, A, B, C, are the ones you use throughout the whole study. That's the panel study. But with the core study, you choose three people for maybe a given class. The next time you come, you come and choose Araba and another set of people. Next time you come and choose George and another set of people. So what you are then doing is a cohort a core study, a long, long study, and a long detail study, which is cohort based. They can also have, lastly, one which is time series that looks at a phenomenon over time and how many changes have happened to that phenomenon. Okay. Any questions so far?
Okay. Any question, team? No questions. Okay. Or any reflection? So let's look at um, qualitative research itself. So what's qualitative research? What is qualitative research? Qualitative researchers study things in the natural settings. They don't say study things in natural settings. They are attempting to make sense of it or interpret it in terms of the meanings people bring to them. So in qualitative research, there are four key things that you should look out for. The phenomenon you want to study, natural settings in which you care, the meanings people as the meanings associated, and who are the people associated with it, the people who are associated with it. Now, others also say that qualitative research is an inquiry grounded in the assumption that individuals as people construct the social reality in the current form of meanings and interpretation, and that these constructions tend to be transitional and situational. He's saying that every time anybody is carrying out a qualitative research, the qualitative researcher tends to create a social reality or understand the, the relative society from the meanings and the interpretations that you may have. And then you, call, you use that one to guide his construction of what is happening. But what, he, what he's trying to emphasize here is that whatever you think you are seeing is temporary and situational. After some time, it could change. So in, in, a, in effect, you have got a phenomenon, the natural is the people, the, the, the social reality, the meanings, and the, time, and the timeline of, of it. Okay. Now let's let's do a, a quick work. What do you think you see? Everybody who are here with me. What do you think? What do you see? Types of chairs. Three types of chairs. Prof, there are three different types of three different types of stuff chairs. Three different types of soft chairs. Three different types of chairs for different um places or purposes. Okay, uh, Prof, I can also see um a sword made with chairs, um, like a tune. It's a tone of seed made with chairs, a sword. Are you sure you are seeing that one? Because I don't see it on our, our slide. Unless you are using another slide. Prof, these are chairs, but made with the different uh Okay. Or with pen technology. You see how, how how all your 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 definitions differ. Okay, so what yeah. we are yeah, well, our observations yeah. are different because of the lens in which we look at the issues we are looking into. Some of you are seeing different types, three types of chairs which have got different purposes. Others are seeing chairs which are being made for out of different materials. Okay. Now, one thing that we can say here is that. The different chairs tell us that there are different chairs for different purposes in society. And in some society, there are some taboos that you need to internalize before you can understand what's happening with the chair. So to be able to see, you need to internalize the taboos or the context that the culture why do we do what we do in our in our view and meaning? So it's not every chair that you can sit on. Is that is that every chair that will give you the outcome that you are looking for? So we need to internalize what the chair is before we can then even sit on it. But you see, what your observation is transitional because when I add a, a skin, like a skin of an animal on the floor right now. The definition of chair will change. It will not be more about the physical infrastructure, but maybe be about where people can sit. Do you agree? 
Yeah. That's true, bro. Yeah. That's true. Yes, you agree. Okay. Now, so in qualitative research, we are describing variation. We're not, de we're not going to uh, uh, quantify it. So we can describe the variation here. What are the differences that we see? So let's try one. Um, who can tell me the differences you see here, apart from they being three? The color. Okay, color. The color is, you see, one thing about qualitative research, let me show you. Color is at a very base level. You call that on a descriptive code. You are describing what is there. So give me more of a, a narrative code that will tell us what the things are and what they do. So, so this is some of for the office use. Exactly. Yeah, they some serve different purposes. And others are used at home or multi-purpose. So there's a sofa which could be used in the office and also even at home. And depending on what you are intending to use it for. And there's a chair that is intended to be used for official work, either in the office or a study. Okay. So we can look at a variation and we can also describe and explain the relationships. What, what common relationship can you see among all of them? They are all made up. Uh, I mean, they are made for the purpose of sitting on them. They are made for the purpose of what? Sitting on them. Of sitting. Yeah. Okay. Is that all? They, oh, they are all made. There, there's an element of leather in all of them as well. Okay. And I guess oh. one, um, two of them has the base of wood, and then the other has some steel in it. Okay. Let's let's see the relationships in a different way. Now, they are all chairs. They are all seats. Seats in the sense that they can receive a person to sit on it. But what about the fact that they all have a base? Hello? What about the fact that they all have a base? That means that a seat should have a base to be able to receive the person. A base supporting it. So, for example, the first one has four legs. The second one has four legs. The third one has one central leg that breaks out into four. Um, yeah, into five. So they all have a base that supports the, the sitting area. Is that, do you see that? Yes, Prof. Yes, please. Yes. Good. And there are some assumptions here. The, 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 the strength of the base should be well positioned to be able to receive the maximum or allowable weight at the top. Is that not it? Mm -hmm. That's true. Now, do you see the relationship? So there's a relationship between one for each of the cases. There's a relationship between the base and then the weight that the, the, the chair can take. Is that not true? That's true. That's true. And that is common to all. Is that not true? Yes. That's true. Good. So you have seen a replication here, and that gives you much more credibility or validity to what you're finding. That is not your experience finding. You actually found it in case A, case B, case C. I can see it being repeated across all. Okay. Now, to describe the individual experiences and describe the group norms, how will we be able to do that? This one means that I need to be able to find out those who have sat on this type of chair before. Now, some of you are here. Let's take um, someone like uh, Ra Ra Raman, Fadil Raman. Raman, you have sat on a swivel chair before. How did it feel? I feel one. I've been sitting on one now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now R Raman is sitting on one and using it for a lecture. 
Roman, what other what does it give you that the other ones will not be able to give you? I think that uh, it's healthy and uh, it enables me to move around. Okay, so we can see two things that Ma Ma Rama Raman has said. Who can tell me the two key code word code words he's mentioned? Flexibility, flexibility and relaxing. It is anything about relaxing. You see, you are coding what is not there. Mobility. Flexibility of movement. Mobility and then what again? Comfort. No. Right? Comfort. And health. And health. He said our comfort. And health. He said health. 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 Oh, Who are jumping health. the code as health as meaning, co meaning comfortability? Comfortability is not anything to do with health. Mm. So, if something is uncomfortable, it doesn't mean that it's unhealthy. Josh, I agree with you, bro. See, this is, you are, this is qualitative research. You are, you, that's as what you see. So, you see how people will see different things. And then that is why you need to be checking with the, with the frame that you have for the research. If you have a frame like literature review, and then what do you, how do you compare with it? Raman has told us about health and mobility. Okay. Now, um, I believe uh, somebody like um, Adam Oliver, you have um, a sofa in your house. I believe so. So, Adam, uh, how does it feel in sitting in a sofa? It feels comfortable. comfortable. So, you can relax, lie in it. So, why don't you have the sofa at your place? Uh, why don't you have the swivel chair at your at the home? Why don't you have the sofa? Because the swivel chair would not, um, not give me that comfort that the sofa would give me. The swivel chair can take probably just one person. A sofa can take more than one. And it's also no, 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 the table. The, 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 take your time. Adam, the data in front of you are one seater for so, so. I didn't say okay. three seater. So, <laughs> all right, bro. Please, what do you see? Stick to what you qualitative so research. I, you don't go and say things you don't see. Your, your biases is coming into it. So I'm teaching you something about quality. How your own biases in your previous experience. We are not saying that we are asking about only the so far the, the, the one seat. Yes. So say it, it it gives me that comfort. Okay. You are just talking about comfort, but you see, as a researcher, comfort has to do. I want to say that uh, the other one is not comfortable. And so let me, okay, let me go on then. Because he said I was seeing things that were not there, so. <laughs> yes. No, and, it's, and it's, it's, a, it's a swivel chair not comfortable for a home. Why is it not comfortable for a home? The certain would not be right for it. Thank you. you so you are not talking about functionality. So now the code you have mentioned is functionality with comfort. Do you see what yes, I'm trying to say? Good. Yes, sir. Now, if you go back to this guy's own, he mentioned... What wedding, what, which of uh, Raman's quotes relate to functionality? That's the end of movement. Mobility, good. But he, he might be in an office environment or he's studying, or he's studying in his house. So let's say that, yeah. So now we, we see how researchers, um, qualitative research is, whenever you are looking at the data, you have to ask yourself, what do you see? In the eyes of, not your eyes, so the person who is sitting on the seat, as he's telling you, then you ask him more questions. But you also have to be very careful when the, the, the respondent is now adding things which are not part of what he's talking about. Otherwise, the researcher can mislead you. The, the okay. respondent, sorry, the respondent can mislead you. So let the respondent stick to the data and not add other things which are not part of the data. Okay. So do you understand it? Hello? Yes, bro. Yes, bro. So we have described the individual experiences. Now we can also describe the group norms. Group norms will come up if more of it, like we're doing a focus group discussion. And I could ask the questions like one round, I can ask go around and go around and they talk about it and we can establish that everybody in the group tends to agree on this one. For example, if we say how many of you are in the office right now, how many of you are sitting on civil chairs right now, apart from Rama, let's see that. How many of you are sitting on civil chairs right now? I, I am sitting on a, a civil chair now. 
I am sitting on a swivel chair right now. Okay, guys, those who are sitting on a swivel chair, let your hand be up. Okay, okay. Please let your hand be up, please. We are going to do the group. I want to understand how the group thinks. Now, Mary. Um, yes, sir. How does, what is your experience in sitting on a swivel chair? It makes me alert and I'm able to move around in the office wherever I decide. So you it makes me to stretch you are out and pick things easily. Yeah. You are mentioned alertness and then you are mentioned mobility. Okay, good. Yes, please. So now mobility is for two, alertness one and health one. Please don't copy everybody's, say it from your mind, heart, like you express yourself. Don't say that you are fitting yourself into the code. I just want to ask mommy, why, what's your experience in sitting in a civil chair? In fact, you even change the question, uh, why, why did you offer this civil chair when you went to the office? Or it was given to you just like that? <laughs> okay, so Prof, uh, Prof, for me, I didn't have a, an option. That, that's what is provided, but it works for me because I'm able to move around my desk. Okay, so mobility here. And then um, um, in terms of access, you see, if the question is about um, your experience in using the chair, you have mobility. But if my question was about how do you access it, he, 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 it was given to you, so there's no choice. It's a, a prescribed. I hope, I hope you understand. It's prescribed or assigned, so you cannot do much about it. There's a very limited option on that one. Okay, that's very good. Okay, okay, okay. That's good. Um, please, you can put your hands down. Now, we are seeing that mobility tends to be more of the and functionality of the office environment. It tends to be, because alertness has to do with functionality of the office environment too. So we see functionality in the office environment, mobility is what is the dominant team. So the group agrees that mobility and functionality matter to uh, in the selection of a chair in the office environment. Is that not true? That's true. Good. Yeah. Now, true, Prof. When you are doing qualitative research, you have to be flexible. You cannot be very, very uh, 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 rigid That's in terms of how you ask the questions. You, are, you need to have a creative style of eliciting the, the response. It's not what I was doing. I'll go here and ask and I'll ask again. That kind of thing is what I was trying to point out here. And you also need to be able to combine a different number of approaches, interviews, individual ones, focus group when you put the group together. So I tried to put the group together here. I did in the individual. And I can do participant observation. For example, I'm not there, but I can ask uh, Raman, what type of, how many how many legs have your, your, your server chair have? How many ties? Like how many uh, uh, web, 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 web links has it have? So I have an idea. Some of them are three, some of them are five. How many does your own have for Raman? Oh, it's gone. Oh, Mary, how many does yours have? Mine is five. five. Oh, mine is five. Yes, please. So I could also ask other things that can give me and help me observe. But the five gives me a, a different types of uh, understanding. And when you have no, more, it's five. Uh, Raman, so it was five. I think yes. the, the, the 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 more stable ones are the ones that have more more wheels. If I'm right, those of you have got experience. Is that true? <laughs> I'm not bringing. No. <laughs> okay, also depends. No, we on the just sit on them. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we are combining uh, interviews, observation, and then documents and audiovisual. Audiovisual. If I had been there in their office, I could take pictures of it and look at it. Or I could also ask them who is the manufacturer. They tell me it is maybe Akia. And I can go to our website and which brand, Akia 259, and I go look at it and then be able to have an idea of what it is. Then documentation. Maybe if I was asking questions about how do you come about it? Who gave it to you? In case it breaks down, who is the one who, what's the process of requesting for a new one? If there's a document for, for requesting for a new one, I could check the, those ones out. Now, one of the things that was happening right now is that you, the researcher, have to be aware of your own orientation and biases. When I was asking the questions, I put myself aside and I tried to listen to the people, but I also tried to make sure that the biases of the responses, respondents does not affect the study. Somebody was trying to talk about a three-seater. One more two, I asked my one-seater. So whenever you are doing qualitative research, you have to also understand that you are having a personal interaction with a context. And that personal interaction can lead to you influencing the answers. So you will not hear what the people will say. You will hear what you want to hear. And you have to be able to bracket that out. Otherwise, it should not be their views. It should be your views that you record. Especially in those who will be doing political marketing or political financing or anything to do with 
things that have got a, a, a little bit of um, emotion attached to it and sensitivity. Where they, they find it very difficult to differentiate themselves and then what they are trying to study. So you the researcher, you always have to be aware of the biases that you bring to the research so they can eliminate them from the study. Are we okay? Okay, good. Yes, bro. Yes, bro. So what are key features of qualitative research? First of all, qualitative researchers always draw on multiple perspectives, not only one perspective. I did it right now. They also draw on several social backgrounds. They try to look at different perspectives from different people who are related to the phenomenon. You don't interview people who are not related to the phenomenon. You have to relate to people who are related to the phenomenon. Now, let's give an example. Let's say, um, um, who, who grew up in Kumasi here? Prof, I grew up in Kumasi. Okay, good. Which part? Asafo, Menshia. Okay, good. Now, if I in Asafo, to... that's where I grew up and Menshia, where I stayed. Okay, let me ask a question. If I go to Kuma, go to uh, 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 like uh, Asafo right now and ask somebody that do you own this enterprise, what do, what are the possible answers that you get? Share with me in, in, that this shop that you are, do you own it? If you ask somebody in the Asafo, just ask. What are the possible answers I will get? Hello. Hello. In fact, maybe I. I Hello. Okay, if you can let me ask Martin. Martin, you also grew up in Kumasi. Hello, yes. 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 Anybody in Kumasi who can answer that question, or from Kumasi, or who has lived or experienced Kumasi, when you ask them, you own this enterprise, what would they? What are the possible answers that you get? Martin or anybody who can help. Right. Uh, they will say no, but it's for my. You said no, but it's for my my what? My uncle. My uncle. Good. That's one. That's interesting. Yes. Any other perspective? Prof, do you hear me? Yeah, we hear you, Nana. Hello. Okay, we hear you. Uh, yes, I inherited it. Uh, it's for the family. Okay, it's for the family. Good. It's for the family. Okay. Now, the reason why I'm asking that question is that Whenever you say do you own an, do you own this enterprise, you have to ask your question, in, especially in Kumasi, you have to be sure that which of them are you talking about? Who makes the key managerial decisions? Or who, whether it is for a, a family member or it's an inheritance or a partnership. Because the person who makes the decision that doesn't necessarily mean that the person who, who owns it. So if your question is about day-to-day -day management of the place, then you are looking for the manager. But if you are about who owns it, you may tell that it's for the family, as you just mentioned. So the word own there may mean different things in different backgrounds and different contexts. If your, if your ownership is related to the one who makes decisions about it, it could actually tell you a different answer. But if your ownership is about the person who is who has said that this can close it down and say it's not running anymore, then it could also be a different person. So when you use the word own within a context like Kumasi, you always have to know how to define it. And that's one problem about, one interesting thing about qualitative research. The words that we use in qualitative research have to be contextualized. Otherwise, people, the participants may give you different answers that you're not expecting. So sometimes we even define the, the key words to them. So they have a, we all share the same understanding before we, uh, we start answering the questions. Okay. Ownership has several meanings. That's what I was trying to point out. Next one is, uh, which I mentioned earlier, that you, the researcher, you have to also be aware of the subjectivity that you have, that you bring to the research. And so sometimes the biases that you have, 
that can affect the way the study is being done and affect the way you analyze it and, and you, you, you collect the data. Otherwise, you will not hear what the people are telling you, but you always only hear what you want to see. Or your personal experience is what you end up documenting. Another thing is that qualitative research is always drawn, drawing on a non-manipulative and non a non-manipulative and a non-controlling approach of research. You are studying the real world, but in, in the natural state, how does the thing happen naturally? I remember I was collecting data from uh, Kwaya Kayo people and, um, and, and these insurance traders, I gave them some lunch to eat. And I asked, the lunch was coming, we were answering the question. When the lunch finished, they told me that they have more answers for me if the food is coming. Then I realized that it's becoming a little bit controlling. So you have to be very careful because some of the answers may not be true. It's not dependent to, on the food, not on dependent on the, the, the validity of that. Because the answers could have, they could have finished telling me what I want. But now they want to tell me more, but the more will come only when the food is coming. So then I realized that I have to be very, very careful because if I don't take it and I start using the, the, the food to control, all that I get may not necessarily be the uh, uh, appropriate um, answers. I was using it as a motivation, but then it became an opportunity of, for control. So it's not manipulative, it's not controlling. That's one. Number two, the study itself has to be imagined. If it's not on your field, researchers can change the way they ask questions. They can bring question one to question two, or question five to question two, or question 22 to question one. Why? Because a lot of things can happen in the field that new questions can come up. So we don't have a very rigid design when we are doing qualitative research. We have more and more flexible, adaptive design approach. I remember I went to somebody's office and when I went there, I saw uh, um, an other dear sticker there. And I said, hey, other dear, other dear, we're talking about a preset and our days there. By the time I finished, I started asking questions from a different uh, uh, perspective. I started with my more difficult questions, which I know you will not like to answer. Because now we have built some familiarity and I wanted to, him to answer that one before I came to questions which were very, very easy for him to answer. But if I didn't see there, if I just went and went straight to my questionnaire, by the time maybe I got into the questions where I'm more sensitive, you would, would have told me that no, he can't answer. But when I realized that we have built some rapport, I started with the more difficult questions because he could trust me and I could actually use that one. So you have to also have be, be, can, can be innovative and know how to, be able to adapt to the, your, your, your inquiry to your understanding to the environment, as the, the people understanding the things to about your study, you can be able to ask more difficult questions or even start from it when you have built more familiarity with the person. You also have to be sensitive to the situation that you are, you are in. Some of the things that are happening have happened historically and the person cannot even remember. So maybe the person that you need to interview may not be the person who is sitting in front of you, maybe another person. Others who are also temporal, so they, they just happy it doesn't mean that it's okay again. So whatever it is that you are studying, understand the social dynamics that around the con around the phenomenon that you are trying to study, and also I'm trying to appreciate that it's not all the questions that you need to ask through interviews. Some of them can be observation. For example, you go to some office and as an HR and a nature study, you are, you are studying maybe uh, let's say uh, uh, employee appraisals. Then you see that they have they have a. Uh, uh, employee mantra on the wall, and you read the manual, and the mantra says that respect to all employees, and da, 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 then you read it. Then do your interview, something happens, and you see the HR manager rather shouting on somebody. Then you rather you, you compare it with the thing, hey, this respect to this, this person is practicing it. In front of me, you shout on the person, showing a lot of disrespect to the person. And you, you can, you can, then you give some opportunity for you to now delve deeper to know whether that is just something on the wall, they don't believe in it, or they don't actually practice it. So observations may be good interviews and audiovisual. Now that we have an age of internet, audiovisual data matters a lot. What you pick on the internet, what you pick as pictures and, and video, all become part that you can transcribe. Then the documents that you come across. Okay. Uh, we are almost, time. time is up. I would have jumped into um, uh, finishing everything now, but I don't want to rush it. So, and we, I'd, I'd like to take questions now and then I'll pause here. Hello? Hello? Yes, Prof, we are here. Yeah, uh, Prof, we are here. 
Yeah, I said that it's almost time. So I wanted to pause yeah, yeah. and then take questions from you so that next week you can continue from here. So, Prof, um, if I may ask, um, you, you, when you asked the question earlier, you said we were, some of us were introducing our own biases and all that. Are there instances where in the course of a qualitative research, um, um, you may want to either, because you could find that sometimes the, 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 either the researcher is going or probably is saying something different from what he means to say. Is it possible without necessarily introducing your personal biases and be to reshape or change to suit what probably is originally intended? Yes, um, um, I won't say the researcher, but more the respondent, because you are the one in control. As the respondent, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so you have to always yeah. keep re respondents in line. But you have to use wisdom, because sometimes the person may be, want, may be leading to something that you don't know. But that's in, he may not present it in an orderly manner. I was collecting data on, from the informal economy. I went to that particular um, uh, shop about 10 times until I found some, something very, very interesting on the ninth time. All the first eight times, I was getting other information which was relevant, but it was no more, more interesting to my PhD. As we were getting more familiar with me, they started opening up and telling me more things. So sometimes you have to very use wisdom to be able to delve deeper into the information you're looking for. And as as they open up, you can be able to get a better understanding of what the person was trying to tell you. Then you will go back and then eliminate what is not needed and then and put in what is needed. I don't know whether I've answered your question. I'm what I'm trying to point out is that it might not be very easy from the beginning, but you may have to be able to use tax. Well, if you just shut down yeah. every res the respondent and everything is telling you, you still use to Yeah. And if you also allow you to end up talking about Every single thing that doesn't matter. <laughs> no, let me just give an example. You are doing, you are doing organizational study. They are giving you 15 minutes to come and discuss um, 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 uh, empowerment of women in the workplace. And the person talk about hmm, the way the men have been treating us and the way the men have been treating us. If you don't take care, you end up getting only one, one, one dimension of the answer. Well, salaries is also part mm. of the way they treat women unfairly. So if you don't take all the questions to be the way the men have been treating us, you don't look at salaries, you don't look at other dimensions of your study. The provision of uh, uh, policies to guide women for uh, uh, ret returning mothers, maybe baby friendly policies. All of these things are things that are interesting for to support uh, for gender empowerment in the workplace. But if you don't take care of the way the men have been treating us, you end up listening to the way the men have been treating us throughout the whole discussion. So you have to find a way of moving on from that the way the men have been treating us to other variables to study. That's right. Thank you, Prof. Thank, Thank you. you. OK, Prof, in, in that same regard, I had the same challenge uh, that uh, Nana spoke to. But I wanted to also ask, uh, with the last semester, Professor uh, um, brought the issue of axiology and how our axiologists also determine the paradigms we pick in our research studies. And I believe you also mentioned it in the introduction. And so when it comes to our biases, is it not also about the paradigm we decide to then interrogate? Because definitely if I'm doing an interpretive study, looking at how perhaps sanitation is affecting uh, the people in my community, and I decide that I put myself in that situation, there's no way I can detach myself from uh, the experience in the community. So certainly uh, my value systems are going to impede or affect, and uh, then the bias issue of bias comes in there. So I was okay. wondering then how do we detach that? Okay, it's so many let, of the let, later, on, later, on, uh, in re later on, I'll be teaching you on validity and reliability in, in research. So I'll, I'll go into detail, but let me just in a nutshell put some, something into perspective. When we talk about biases coming into the research, we are not talking about the fact that your values will not be, will not show up. But what we are trying to say is that you don't end up writing what you think is the right way of doing things than what the community is telling you. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? 
you are there to be a recorder, not to be able to interpret it in a way that you tell the story of how you think it should be. For example, let me let, let me just give you an example. You go into a community and they tell you that they don't see anything about anything wrong about um or, or child labor. Now you are doing a study on child labor. You are supposed to document it that they don't see anything about child labor. You are not supposed to write that these people are wrong. Child labor is a serious issue. And the way they are taking it on, on no, 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 that's not at, at the data level. You are not doing that. Write out and try to interrogate why they don't see it as anything as an issue. For example, those who don't quite a number of people don't see it as an issue is that they use they used to pass on the learnings to other children, to uh, family, family, family uh, property and uh, family skills to other people. So a family is known as a blacksmith family. They, you start learning the blacksmith as age as uh, nine years old. You help your dad work on the blacksmith. I was at that bosom and I learned that that kind of thing was going on there. So, but when people were growing up, they didn't want to go into blacksmith anymore. They wanted to start going to uh, uh, tailoring and other things. But still, to be able to not lose the, the your father's blessing, you will still have to learn the blacksmith thing. Then after that, go and learn your tailoring and whatever you want to learn. So the culture, the thing was still passed on to you as a skill. But then you can still choose not to do with it and go and do something else. So that, and if I was doing a geographic study, that's actually a very, very important finding I'm supposed to bring out. I'm not supposed to go and say that this is bad, that you can't do this, you can't engage a person in, in this at this age and all kinds of stuff. And that's not what I'm doing there. What I'm doing is collecting data. My analysis can be for something different and for different audiences. Sometimes the problem we have as qualitative researcher, we try to change and make the community better whilst we are collecting the data. That one becomes action research. That's different. But if you are doing ethnography, you are not doing action. If you are doing phenology, you are not doing action. I don't know whether, have I answered your question? I don't know whether I've answered it. Yeah, yes, Prof, certainly. I was wondering then uh, what, uh, what are some of the, the unintended consequences uh, from uh, the narrative you have given us? It's very clear, I've received. So I was thinking aloud that okay. in our uh, questioning, yes. Okay, so if you look at it, these are there are many dimensions of qualitative research, but these are the four that you guys talk about here. One, phenomenology looks at describing one or more individuals' experience of a phenomenon. For example, the experience of a death of a loved one. It's out of phenomenology that you have biography and autobiography, and all of those things come out of phenomenology type of research. Ethnography looks at the culture in which the thing is happening in and how it affects the or influences the phenomenon you are trying to study. Case study looks at uh, a given, uh, a bounded, a bounded, um, a bounded phenomenon. So, for example, somebody wants to do a case of um, KNUSC, a case of of, of of Ministry of Education on on certain policy. So, you're trying to study uh, a, a, a defined boundary of a given phenomenon. Okay. Then, grounded theory tries to pick the data as is and try to theorize from the data. So all of them have got different approaches in which they carry out the research. All of them have different different approaches in which they carry out the, 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 the research. If you take a um, 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 case, for example, quite, quite this one, phenomenology, for example, there's humanistic phenomenology and there's transcendental phenomenology. The first one looks at text, interpreting the text to explore the lived experience of people. So somebody can take somebody documented account of, of an experience. What are the doctoral students' supervision experiences as interpreted through their blogs, chats, and tweets? So people write, as they write out, you study it and try to develop a story of what they are going through. A transcendental phenomenology is done, you are going to talk to the students and look at their lived experience as part of the PhD program. And with the aim of trying to describe the essence or the essential elements of their experience. And this is not a case study. That, that's just telling them that their experiences. Ethnography will rather try to look or stay, take a long time and study a culture and look at how the cultural characteristics of a group influences the phenomenon you're trying to study. So understanding, the, one example is understanding the, the evolving nature of cybercrime and the criminality in Islam communities in Accra. I have to go and live in the Islam community, for, for example, and study it there. And observe patterns and observe how 15 year olds are, are 
conscientize into getting to cyber crime. I can't just go there by one day and just come out. I need to stay there over time and understand how culture, the culture and the environment creates an envir enabling, uh, uh, enabling uh, context for these things to occur. The, the case study is more about a bonded system or an activity or even a person. So somebody can study uh, a classroom, somebody can study a year group, somebody can study, um, let's say, a market, somebody can study a phenomenon in a market. For example, Kayayu, I want to study Kayayu in a, a, a Kumasi and study, uh, build a cases out of each individual Kayayu. But somebody can also do a phenology, phenological study on Kayayu and their live experiences as Kayayu. All of them have got different approaches that are going to go, go across, you, you use that, you use in, in qualitative research. For, for example, if I'm doing a case study, I'm trying to look at the real occurrence of this issue and trying to gain certain um, perspectives that I will not gain if I, was, if I was not studying it as a system and the interaction that come together in, in, in that system. So I have to define the boundary of that system. I can define the boundary by, by time, by an event, or by an occurrence in the particular community. So somebody can say, I'm studying Kayo in, um, in Kumasi. I'm building a case of them, but I'm trying to study those who are into tomato selling. And those who joined tomato in since 2020, since 2020, during the COVID time. So I've defined a boundary for them and I try to define what I want to study about them. Most of the study students in the business could do case studies if they're doing qualitative. If they're not doing that one, then they will be doing phenomenology. Very few, very, it's very rare for you to hear students doing ethnography because it takes a longer time to collect the data, sometimes about eight months. So this is an example of a case for, of a tomato retail trader about how she uses mobile phones. So this one is just a case study. So it talks about who she is as a retail trader, when she, well, and when she began her business, what she was doing before, how she was communicating with her trading partners before she gained a, got a phone, when she got a phone, how she has started communicating with them, and the impact of the phone on her business. So that's what the case is done. It's, it's written. Okay. So last one has to do with um, granite theory. Granite theory usually draws on the process of the the process, the, and theorize the process and then look into the data. So you have a person trying to do a study. Then you look, turn the whole data you have collected as a, as a means of doing a theory. A theory means you're trying to identify patterns of occurrence in this particular, of that particular phenomenon within the data. So you study the data for some time and see what can I theorize? What explanation can emerge or why does this occur in a particular way? Now, this one is very good when a current theory is not there to be able to explain what you want to study. So you need you want to theorize your own theory based on the data you have been given. And it could also take some time because you need a lot of data to, 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 to theorize. Currently, most students don't do this because you, most of you would rather, rather do um, take a theory and take it to the field. But granted theory, you can read the theories, but you don't take the theory to the field. You take the, you go to the data, Go to the field, collect the data, and then theorize based out of the data. So the out of the data, you come out with a theory. Being grounded in the data means theory is localized, dealing with specific situation like how women micro entrepreneurs handle multiple responsibilities. So you are going to theorize be based on that. Now th this is relevant where there's no theory or limited theory in explaining the phenomenon. So what what how do you do it? So there are four key steps. You have to identify the core phenomenon and identify the conditions that cause that phenomenon and the strategies that people use to adapt concerning that phenomenon and the consequences of it. So somebody asks a question now, how do women micro entrepreneurs handle multiple responsibilities? So the first question, what's the process of, 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 of these women in terms of what process do they go through in managing multiple responsibilities, sorry. Okay. Sorry, I had an interference in my, a call came through. I hope I can, you can hear me. Can you hear me now? 
Can you hear yes, me? Please, yes, please, we can please. hear you. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. So what is the process? What influenced the process to occur? What actions were taken to respond to the yes. process? What were the outcomes of the strategies? So you end up starting by identifying the phenomenon. What influenced the phenomenon to occur? What actions were we taking in response to the phenomenon or in response to the to the influences of the phenomenon? And then what are the outcomes? Now, what I usually like students to do is that talking about these things is very easy. But I try to tell students, challenge them that go and take um uh, let me jump to. I was going to talk about your if you have some time, can I spend 15, 10, uh, five minutes just talk about how all these things influences your PhD? Uh, or some of you have a class after this. Yes, please. We have a class after. We have a class. The, the, the next, the next one. Oh, you have a class at one test. Let me, let me, let me, let me see. So I've got, I've got 20, I've got 10 minutes. So let's use that one. Okay. We need 10 minutes. So in places, quantitative researchers embrace the idea of multiple realities. And that's, I understand that everything they are doing is subjective. They have to unearth and report these multiple realities that exist. Now, you, the researcher, you're not independent from what is being researched. Uh, but you need to appreciate that the knowledge that you are trying to gain is context and time dependent. That means that the context can influence the knowledge and the time that you went there can also influence the knowledge. So that means that if I go there tomorrow, the likelihood I'll get the same answer may not be, may, may, may be quite, could, could be quite slim because certain new things could have happened. For example, I go and collect the data, the data, the day is raining. The day you came, it was not raining. Could be different the way people respond to, especially we are studying, I'm uh, studying, uh, studying about sanitation and culverts in the local communities in Medina, and that's what I'm trying to study. If I go there on a rainy day, the answer I'll get will be very different from, and it's, the culverts are getting full and all kinds of stuff. It will be very different from going there on a, on a non rainy day. I, I don't know whether you can appreciate that, what I'm trying to say, Ata Isa and Asa JB. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Knowledge is established through the meanings people attach to the phenomenon being studied. Qualitative researchers, uh, or qualitative research in general, are historically inductive, emergent, and shaped by the researcher's experience in collecting data. The more you do, the better you become. Research questions may change or emerge in the middle of the study to get a better appreciation of what you are trying to study. Okay. Now let's look at the centrality of your PhD. Now, the reason why you do a PhD is because you want to contribute to knowledge. To contribute to knowledge, you need to be able to draw on a theory, which is the key aspect. Because whenever you finish your PhD, you'll say, what theory have you contributed to? How has your work informed theory? But your contribution can also influence the issue you are trying to study. For example, you may be the first person studying this issue in this particular way or using this theory. Or you are the first person studying this issue using this particular method or using this theory in this particular method. Or you may be the first person using this theory in this particular context, Ghana, or the domain, healthcare, or finance. Or you're the first person using the theory combined with the method and the issue in this particular context. So it's a combination of these four variables that em emphasize your contribution. What did I say? Niyama, what did I say? Yeah, I think you didn't hear me. I said it's a combination of these combination. four things that come together, three and four things that come together to point out your contribution. So if you are doing a PhD and you don't know where your centrality of your PhD lies, it lies in the question that can generate the knowledge. So if you have don't ask the right questions, you cannot be able to inform theory and inform the rest of the other ones. So let's get into detail. When you do a PhD and you go to the final stage and you say you are finished, we would like to see how has your work affected research, current research in the area. One, and the evidence that you are published something out of the work that it's not there that we didn't know. So your publications from the research whilst you're doing your PhD matters. I have a presentation called the PhD journey. 
please, uh, one of our tutorials, remind me to, 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 to do that presentation to you. So I, to let you know what you're supposed to do in year one, what you're supposed to do in year two, what you're supposed to do in year three and year four. So please remind me. Now, number two, concept creation. Did you create a new concept? For example, one of my PhD students who got uh, 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 the Vice Chancellor's Award for Best Thesis in the Humanities, Joseph Budu, created a new concept called heritage value. Now, he was studying the value creation in the music industry and realized that there is financial value and there's symbolic value. But he created a new one called heritage value. He realized that when digital platforms come and you take and produce music and you digitize it and place it on the internet and people are listening to it, the heritage of Ampedu uh, music has been, has been preserved and made available to another generation. So he called it heritage value. So you can create a new concept in your PAD and that will give you a PAD. Now, you can also publish a literature review. A literature review meaning that in existing, before you started the PAD, there was no existing review on the area. Nobody knew, uh, had done all, the, all research on all the current works and be able to define a gap in the current works. Uh, please, am I sharing my screen? Oh, no. I'm not sharing. Please, my no. Oh, no problem. No, it's, it's your picture. Your picture is showing. Hey, so I, I realized it. I'm, 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 I'm using the slides and nobody's talking about it. <laughs> sorry, 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 sorry. I'm sorry. So this is what I'm saying. This, so this we're, we're, enjoy, we're enjoying the presentation. Okay, I'll, I'll put the slides in the in the class group. So I think some of you are already downloading. Okay. So this is what I was talking about: the theory, the issue, the method, and the context goes to your knowledge contribution. Then I mentioned that your research publications is number one. Number two is the concept creation. Number three is the literature review as a product. So if you look at it, someone like uh, Dr. Rafael Odum published out of his PhD. Um, a review on brand and um, branding in SMEs. Now, when Rafa was doing his PhD, I remember he was having an issue. We had a discussion. And I told him that you need to do a, a, a thorough review of your of the area so that you can establish what has been done, what has not been done. And he did it. So when he went for his vibe, I said that in that literature review you see in the chapter there, he's going to publish it. And that one is a new thing that has not been done. Before he started his study, there was nobody who had done a review on branding of SMEs in that way. So and, and I, I, I taught him some of the methods of doing review through this particular, I, he didn't take the class, but I taught him on the, the, the principles from the class and he applied it and he wrote the paper and I co-authored it with him and the other mm -hmm. supervisors. Now, if you see Joshua Ophelia's uh, uh, paper two on, uh, on API, uh, 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 application of API and the review on it, he also published a review as a product from his PhD. So he can publish a product or your literature review as a product, if it's done very well, are from your PAD. That's if the area, some areas, there are a lot of literature reviews already, but some new, some areas That's exist that the literature review the exists, a review of the literature has not been done in a thorough manner, so you can do that. Now, another person can contribute a new theory or extend existing theory. So maybe the existing theory has done A, B, C, D, but has not been applied in a new way or the current way that you are going to apply it. So you apply it in a new way can be an extension to the theory and that can be contribution to a PAD. Another thing is that you can also apply a method. For example, you may be the first person using critical realism to study this phenomenon or using positivism or using interpretivism to study the phenomenon. That can be a contribution. Or you may be the first person who is studying the phenomenon in this particular way from an African context or from Ghana, also method. Or you are the first person who is doing a quantity, there is a, the, the, Previous authors have asked for more qualitative research in this area. So sometimes the existing research can tell you that we need more qualitative research in this area. You may be the first person to do that, and that one could be could be could be a contribution. Paradigm, as I mentioned earlier, that you may be the first person applying that paradigm. The context to being the first person to do it in Ghana. Now, as we go down, the most important one is responding to a gap that somebody has mentioned, especially somebody who has published the gap or the need for that study in a top ranking journal in your area of study. 
So most of the times, when you start your long as your thesis, I tell the students that please go for the top ranking journals in your, your, your discipline and look out for research gaps from those ones. When you get a top ranking journal to say that your paper, uh, your journal, your work has been done in that area, and, it, and, 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 and there's a gap in that area, it is more difficult for somebody to come and say that your work is not relevant. For example, recently, um, one of my students, um, Brian Champon, his PhD was on mutual understanding. The gap was coming from an ISJ paper, an ISJ is an information center journal, which is uh, one of the top six, uh, top eight journals in our area. And his PhD was on, on mutual understanding. And ISJ has made up a, an argument that mutual understanding in information system needs more studies. So he we picked up on that one and we use that one throughout his PhD. So when you pick some a gap like that, coming from the top journals, whenever you show up at any place, you have got the senior scholars backing you. So whenever you are talking, they ask that who is the one backing you? Who is saying that what you are doing is relevant? So please, whenever you are doing your PhD, as you are, as you are thinking now, who are the top journal authors? Um, to, who are the top? Who are, who, which are the top journals in your area? Which of your PAD questions or which of your PAD gaps is coming from there? Maybe all of them may not come from there, but there's our advice that more of the central one, or at least one of them or two of them should come from the top journals in your area. So then you have come some, some heavy hitters or leading authors or lead, lead, lead researchers globally who are speaking to your work that is relevant. Now, sometimes too, some people do a PhD that is so good that they get appointments even before you finish the PhD. One of my PhD students, um, uh, 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 this gentleman, uh, Kingsley. Kingsley, while she was doing his PhD, he came to see me. One day he started a PhD, he was a, 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 an MBA student. He came to see me as a prof. I want to do a PhD. What should I do? I said, go and do something on gamification, gaming, the use of games in education. That was somewhere in 2015. He didn't even see the link. I said, you go and read about it and come. When you went to read about it, I said you would do it. By the time Kingsley had finished, the special interest group of researchers in the world for gaming gamification, he had become the vice president. That's the world, though. Not, not saying that even in Ghana. He had become the vice president, and then he became the president after serving as the vice president. He became the president. And then he was also able to publish about three different papers from gamification from uh, African context in good ranking journals on the area and became an authority in the area. Why? Because the gap was so clear. Nobody was writing on gamification in a, from an from a, uh, educational point of view in from Africa. Right now, people are writing on gamification in marketing, gamification in HR, gamification in, in different, different things. But it was a, a new area. So the timing was right. And you got appointments out of that. So please, let's look at whenever you're choosing your research area, choose something that has also got longevity. Some people, your research area you have chosen, by the time you get to second year, it's going to be irrelevant. Somebody would have solved it in another university. Fellas, let me finish and then we can wrap up because time of time. Then practice. Practice has to do with the fact that whatever you're trying to do, can practitioners in your area do something with it? Is there anything you can patent? Is there an artifact you can develop? Is there an industry report you can publish? out of your work. Can you, did you do any industry engagement? Currently, my students that are doing their PhD and those who just finished, when you finish your, finish your day, you go back to where you collected data and do an industry seminar and present your final work to them. And they give you feedback to be able to finalize your work. Now, one of my students called um, um, uh, Mansa Preko did that for um, the Ministry of Health and other health professionals. And they, the model she came up with, at the end of the period, they modified it again out of the interaction that, yes, what you're saying is true, but it doesn't work in practice. Now add this and add that and add that. She went into a viva, presented that and presented her post engagement with the, with the, with the industry and got an A in a viva. Or get an A in the thesis. So the thesis got an A. Now what I'm just trying to point out, it's not easy to get an A in the thesis, but to get an A in thesis, then they have actually done a very good work. So I'm trying to point argue here is, when, when you are able to show that industry can also make use of your work, it's very good. One of my students also published, did, an, did a, a seminar that was covered by Joy FM out of the PAD to show that it's, the findings and can resonate with, with the industry and they uh, modified and captured this as part of his work and the latter part of his work. 
So when you're doing your PhD, you always have to ask yourself, what can the organizations and the industry participants use your work for? Not just about the academics. Okay. Lastly, this is I'll be going over later with you. Policy direction, po a policy brief, knowledge workshop. On it. Is that, can your model inform policy? Can it give some directions to policy? Now, it's not all PAD that can inform policy. Not some PAD don't talk about policy. But if your PAD can inform policy, whether at the national level or the organization level or a community level, let it, let it try and make sure that that is more sound and much more complicated. In that case, if you can do a policy workshop or come out with a policy briefing based on the PAD is good. That can be an output out of your work. Excellent. So if you have opportunity to do that, I advise you to do that. There are many circumstances that, that there are many scenarios that I've seen students do this kind of stuff that have been very beneficial to their work. So the policy contribution, the knowledge, the research contribution gets on knowledge, then the, the, the practice, practice contribution matter in your PhD. So those are the things that are important in making in, in establishing the centrality of your PhD. Okay, the guy who wanted to ask the question, please ask your question and then let's uh, um, um, answer. Uh, Prof, I just wanted to alert. Now you wanted to alert me that time myself. Okay, then I'll finish. So this is an assignment we have for you um, in, to submit in the respective dates. For each of the four types of qualitative research, identify a general paper which use that approach and present a summary of how the qualitative research approach was used to address research questions. So phenomenology, grounded theory. Um, um, I want you to read more about so that we can discuss it in class. Can submit it in May. That's about two weeks' time, May 20th, May 20th, May 31st, 2023. Then the next one is um about research problem, purpose of and research problem, purpose and research questions and objectives. Based on six articles from your discipline, ranked four star or three star by an ABC journal. I should be it's supposed to be ABS journal, ABS journal, ABC, ABS journal, please, ABS. There's ABCD general ranking, but I'm looking at ABS. That's the Association of Business Schools. ABS, sorry. So ABS, if I'm corrected. ABS general. I'll correct it and put it in the platform. And three general articles on Ghana. So that means that you have to take six from your the top rank ones and then three general articles, any general article on Ghana, anything that was published on Ghana. At least one of the general articles on Ghana should be from your department. What am I trying to do? I'm trying to let you get an idea of what research work is area, what research works belong to the, to the topic that you want research on from the senior basket of journals in your area and also from the researchers in the department that you belong to. Okay. So that is it for now. Those who are going to another class, you can sign out and go for that class. And those who are staying behind, I can answer questions for about the next five minutes if there's any questions that will come up. Okay, um, Prof, before we sign off, I have one question to ask. Okay. Okay, Prof, um, uh, during the um, phase of the research process that you took us uh, getting to the first part, yes, you mentioned that chapter one, you said um, the process that you, you require to complete your chapter one, but uh, I didn't see um, limitation in those process that you give. Does it mean that um, you can ignore limitation because i see for any work that you do you see uh you will encounter some level of limitation in there but i didn't see that one in the okay so um, um in, for the PAD, limitations will become part of your conclusion okay so when you write implication to research practice and policy then there'll be another one for uh, future research direction limitations, and then another one for future research direction. I'm not reading all of them, but it's part of your conclusion for a PhD. You don't add it to your all right, problem. Yeah, that. All right. If, but if you're writing a proposal, proposal, that one there, I think you can capture it here. If you're writing a PhD proposal, that's different. But if you're writing right. the full thesis, the limitations will go into your conclusion. All right, Prof. Thanks so much. No problem. Yeah, Felix. Hello, Prof. Felix, can yeah, go ahead. Please, uh, the second assignment, if you are able to find the C journals from the ABS, AB, ABS ranking, what if there's a journal for your department which is already at that place? Do you have to look for another one? And also, 
If you no, are no, able I, to I get, ask a question. Well, I didn't get, I didn't get a verse one. If you are able to find what the second are supposed to get six uh, journals from uh, ABS ra ranking of journals, right? So I'm saying that if out of that you are able to get one that is from your department and they are also from Ghana, do you have to go and look for an extra one to be able to satisfy that condition? Okay, so a minimum, eh, if you look at this nine, a minimum you are supposed to use eight of the article, eight articles to write the thing. So it's up to you. You understand me? I'm, I'm yes. giving you an idea of how to write a very good research problem. That's why I was telling you that. Okay. Thank yeah, you. It's possible. Okay. It's possible that some of the ABS journal may be from Ghana already. But all I'm just trying to just say is that you, whenever you're writing a very good research problem, you should have a section that covers on the issue. And I have a section that talks about why Ghana is being selected. That's what I'm trying to point out. And I'll be explaining that as we go on. All right. Thank you. Thank you. That's a very good. That's a good question anyway. Okay. Oh, but any question yourself? Uh, no problem. Okay. Thank you very much. But how was the session? I hope guy. Uh, prof. <laughs> very insightful. Uh, but I know also prof. noticed that you had danced to the slides as well. So it looks like every year uh, things prof, change. It's very in very insightful, educative, but the assignments came too early. <laughs> Thank <laughs> <laughs> we have 11 weeks, so we don't have 13 weeks, so we have to start early. But the dates are not, the assignment is not for today, it's for the dates, it's giving you, so you want me to wait and then give you only one week. One week notice. <laughs> for now, I'll give you, for one of them, I'll give you three week notice, and I'll give you one week notice. <laughs> 